So we'll talk a little more about peers too than for the kids who are socially anxious. They have social phobia of some form, either the generalized type, which is any and every social situation, an evaluative situation knocks them, or the non-generalized type, which might be test anxiety, public speaking anxiety, assertiveness problems. See, if there are a number of different types of social situations that knock a kid, they don't like speaking in class, but they also don't know how to find a place to sit in the cafeteria and it overwhelms them when the kids are making plans and they don't know how to, you know, in interject themselves into conversations and, you know, they get a bad mark on a test, they don't understand it, but they can't ask the teacher why. That's generalized. It goes across a whole range of things. Those kids tend to be uh, temperamentally more on the shy side, uh, more quiet. That's this disorder for these kids is very insidious, goes way back. These are the kids who year after year, parents hear from the teachers from the time they're little in parent-teacher conferences, you know, she's so quiet, I don't even know she's in my classroom. I tell parents, that is a signal to you to do something. The teacher doesn't know your child's in the classroom figuratively. Okay, and then the other thing is when they get to the middle to high school where they're changing classes and the parents go in for the parent-teacher conference and you say, hi, I'm Mary Ann's mom. Mary Ann, Mary Ann, huh, Mary Ann, okay. Now what's happened there is that child's been successful with her or his social anxiety. They've been successfully avoiding, all right? That's not good. That is not good. Um, then that's different. So that usually two to seven years with that kind of anxiety before the parents notice there's a problem. And it's usually in the adolescent years because they, you know, meet their friends, you know, with the, you know, bowling alley or at the mother's lunch or whatever, and the other parents are talking about, oh my gosh, you know, you'd think the car was his, he's always using my car anymore, or, you know, she's always online with her friends and they're out all the time, and I, you know, they, I tell her she's got to be home by 9 o'clock, and I get a call at 9 o'clock, can I have another half hour? So the parents are hearing this and they're thinking, oh, I don't have those problems. Why don't I have those problems? And it's because their kid is always home. I have parents who have told me with the social phobia that, you know, uh, it hits them when on a Friday night after they get home from a work, you know, a work week and they're like, oh, good, you know, there's a 16-year-old, or let's say there's a 17 and a 15-year-old in the house and they're like, oh, thank goodness, they'll be out with their friends. We can, you know, relax, have a nice dinner together, you know, finally mom and dad can have some time. And they walk in and there's their 15-year-old. Hi, what are we doing tonight? <laughs> what do you mean, what are we doing tonight? <laughs> Go make friends. <laughs> Tell them that at 15 is tough. So this is an insidious disorder. Wow. Dave. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, uh that situation uh, made me think about uh, parents that, in fact, maybe w wouldn't do that, that would be gratified that their children were there because they, in fact, suffer from their own anxiety problems. Well, so. apples don't fall far from the anxiety tree. That is right. So my question is, uh -huh. how often do you find that it's also necessary to treat parents yeah. when oh. you're doing this kind of work? Yeah, well... <laughs> That, that is, that, yeah, we, we, we tend to see a lot of anxiety running families. The thing to know is if there's a family history of anxiety or depression, there's a much higher likelihood of the child having something. It doesn't go one to one. If mom has panic disorder and is agoraphobic, it doesn't mean child's going to have panic, but they might have something. So we've had a range, I've answered the phone, you know, hi, I'd like my daughter to see you. She has school refusal, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine, come in this week. Well, my sister's going to bring her in because I have agoraphobia. Ah, oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, no, no, I, you know, and I, and the thing of it is, that's when I, you know, go after it. It's like, well, you know, I have to form a relationship with this person in some way to say, you know, 
you know the old saying, you can treat the addict, but when they go back to the community and the shooting gallery is still next door, it's a matter of time before relapse. How am I going to get her riding a school bus and going to school if you won't go to the grocery store? It's tough. You are the primary model for your child. So we got to engage those parents who are really significant in their anxiety, you know, to get some help for themselves too. Uh, the other thing that we would do is see a lot of times, for whatever reason, one parent has anxiety and the other one doesn't, and how they make it work. I love giving the ATIS. One time I was giving the ATIS, I was doing the OCD section, and go through the whole thing, ask about, you know, contamination, washing, blah, 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 all this stuff. And, you know, the, the mother was like, oh, you know, reporting on the child as if, yeah, yeah, we're concerned about this. And at the end, the father says, can I ask you a question? He says, um, I get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. When I come back, my wife has made the bed. Do you think that's problematic? <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, way. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. OK, thank you for letting me know. A lot of times when you do that interview or you're doing your intake, you find out about where the tree is that this apple came from. You know, this is always, I also, you know, the, 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 the spouse who rearranges the dishes in the dishwasher. Actually, that's me. But anyway, so you have got to engage the family. There are some times that we will ask a parent to try and get treatment with a colleague, you know, in and around the area who could treat them. And we try to start them in therapy. Uh, and then about two weeks later, I put the kids in. So mom or dad has a leg up on the psycho ed and the things. You know, but again, you know, we are, of course, we're looking at what's the modal number of sessions people get in the community, you know, four sessions of treatment, you know, what's feasible for this family. Is it, you know, potentially something that you might want to do behavioral family therapy around in some way? So we're treating anxiety in the system in one way. So we have to think about what could work for the families. But they, they're, they're often there. And social phobia is one of those ones where you do tend to see it. But a lot of times what I've found with these families, with kids who have real hardcore social phobia, is you work on that, um, you work on the parents' empathy of, you know, I know you, what did this mean to you when you were a teenager? And if you could change your past, would you have spoken up more at school? Would you have reached out to go to events? And they all say they did want to do it, but they couldn't. So now they want to help their kid to get there, all right? So try to work with that to see how we can empower them to all move along. The other form of social phobia I was going to say that tends to present itself and parents recognize very quickly is when it's focused on test taking or focused on oral reports or things like that. And then, uh, you know, and then you work in a more concentrated way you know, with that type of treatment. And I, I have to say something about selectively mute children who would fall under this. Um, I had a great case many years ago. She was, she was an interesting case of a child, upstate New York, never spoke through eight years of school. And why she was coming in for treatment during the eighth grade was because when they went to visit the high school in March of the eighth grade year that she would be going to, and the high school found out she doesn't speak, and of course the mom and, uh, you know, talked about the accommodations the, the elementary school allowed. They allowed the mother to record oral reports that the child played on a tape recorder. <laughs> yes. Um, so, of course, the high school said, eh, 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 ain't happening, so which is what prompted them to come into treatment. Um, so you have to watch. I mean, when they're early on, their friends learn to say, Miss Smith, Johnny has to use the bathroom. You know, they learn to somehow they're communicating <laughs> to the people around them who meet their needs. Parents who, you know, let's go and get some ice cream, and you go up to the ice cream counter, and look, by four or five years of age, kids are usually asking, you know, go ahead. And the child says nothing, so the parent's like, he'll have a chocolate vanilla swirl or whatever. It's like, oh, 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 oh. You know, so anyway, there's all these different, you know, manifestations of anxiety and selective mutism is one that you got to get on early, hardcore behavioral approach that we use. Um, usually kids are referred to us at 
between four to seven, eight years of age. When it's allowed to go longer than that, again, it's very, very hard to treat, you know? And it's a system that has to change, not just the kid. The system has to change, including the peers. And we've got to get the peers in the class to, start, to stop speaking for them. I have a question regarding anxiety. A child that has um, issues speaking another language, like English or Spanish, that refuses to, to speak it, even though they understand, is that a form of anxiety? Well, that, so the question is, what about a child who's bilingual or, or is, and that they're refusing to speak, let's say, in English in school, but they understand it, and, you know, but they're not speaking it. Um, is, is that anxiety? Well, yes, there's something there. And the question, of course, I would ask is, are they concerned, you know, I would work with them in the way that, you know, we have here. Are they concerned about the accent? Are they made fun of by the other kids? You know, one of the things to watch, actually, is especially kids who are being raised in, in you know, they have a primary mother tongue, and then they're learning the English language. Things don't say, you know, and there may be a vocabulary test, let's say, or the teacher's giving them instructions in first grade or something for a test, and they don't hear things to, uh, translating to write them in English. They don't hear diphthongs and syllables and things in the same way that an, a pure English speaker does. They have to learn to differentiate, you know. I mean, gosh, the, gosh, the Spanish language alone, I get somebody from Barcelona, Barcelona, Cuba, Mexico, you know, and Santo Domingo, they, they pronounce the same word so differently. So then you're taking a child who's been raised with whatever system, and now he's got the English. So it could be, and, and times, you know, we might see kids who are embarrassed by not knowing which is the correct pronunciation for something, so they don't want to speak it. Um, and there could be social anxiety that's in there. Will the teacher come down on me for this? Will I be looked at as stupid? So, you know, there's different things. I would go after trying to uncover what is it about not speaking that language in what contexts. Maybe they are saying it at home, maybe they're not, but I would, I, you'd have to do a real analysis of what's what we call the functional analysis of where is this happening and why, okay? But yeah, we have seen that in different ways with kids, so. Oh, I gotta catch my breath. <laughs> Oh my gosh, how much more time we have? Woo. Okay, and then what are we having at your house later, Dave? Uh, oh. Rum runners I'm getting when I get to your place later? He's driving me home to my family, but we're, huh? I'm from yeah, but I have a variety of. All right, so mint juleps. Mint julep it is. <laughs> so, all right, for, this, for the socially anxious kids, this is where, yes, someone have a question, yes. How do you figure out what's anxiety, let's say, versus adjustment to the culture? It's acculturation issues um, and settling in. Um, th that would be, you'd have to, you have to sit and you have to ask questions. You have to evaluate the length of time they've been here. You know, of course, the big thing, especially with kids who are brought, you know, brought up here now or brought over and put into school, what are they supposed to, what's the, period of time the school allows for adapting to the language before tests are administered. Okay? What's the period of time before they're expected to be writing in the new language, all of their work? I know, look at, I'm getting these two lit up in the middle of the room. Because you know it, that is problematic. Now I know for a fact in New York City they don't give these kids time at all. It is within the year that they're supposed to take those New York, those tests. Right, same here, okay. So it's not, so there's that. Rick Scott, baby, I'm coming after you. Okay, it's not, so there's that aspect. What is, what, what are the, what is the school system calling for for adaptation 
and is it reasonable given the, given the child's age and developmental level? So there's that. The second thing is, how is the family adapting? If you're teaching the child and they're trying to learn English at, at the class and then they go home and everything's Spanish, 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 Creole, 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 what is that doing? And are the adults in the home helping the child to adapt? And can we get a plan together for that? So, you know, I, there's, and so there's multi levels here that may, you know, make the adjustment becomes difficult just in general for the child because the community, including home community, is not supporting their adaptation in an appropriate way. Anxiety is going to go along with that. There, it's a part and parcel of that. So how much of it is anxiety disorder versus any of us dropped in the middle of, if I, they drop me in the middle of France, well, I'm, I don't like the French anyway, but no, if they drop me in the middle of France and you know, I'm supposed to learn how to speak French, it's going to take me a time. If my paycheck depends upon it, oh my goodness, there's going to be anxiety anyway, but what then would be, I'm afraid of the French because they get mad at you if you don't speak their language correctly. <laughs> so, you know, you got to watch this. So I would say you got to take a good look, all right, at what's going on. You, you, you don't think I know about the stuff with these schools and, you know, the testing of the kids. They don't give them to, I know, so I know, I know, I know. So getting to then how do we treat the child with social phobia? Um, I keep trying to use a pointer, but it doesn't really work. Is, oh, there it is. Okay. So we start with the psychoeducation, which you had, you know, what we talked about. We're going to do cognitive restructuring, which is going to get into their heads. Notice that the other kids escaping negative affect, we're putting them in situations. We're going exposure, exposure. Here we're going to, we're going to figure out a little bit of what they're thinking about. Do some role plays, then, and we're adding exposure in. And for these kids, they might need a little more skills training especially social skills, because when the social phobia really rears its ugly head and they start in, stop interacting with their peers and family members, it's not usually just the peers. They stop talking to people. Their social skills could either be rusty from having not used them or maybe not well developed because they didn't let them, you know, they didn't have the practice in the first place. So let's uh, say this, identifying social anxiety. First of all, let me make something very clear. Shyness is not social phobia. Shyness is a pretty normally distributed personality style. These kids are a little more slow to warm up. You know, they're not going to be the center of attention, obviously. Uh, takes them a little while to get into things. But they tend to be the tortoises that do eventually get there. They, they go to things, but they're quieter. You know, so shyness by itself isn't the thing. Social phobia is active withdrawal and avoidance. They don't want to go to these things. They shake, they cry. You know, it's a very different thing than, than just being the low-key, shyer person. All right? It's an avoidant person who's, who's trying to get away from a situation. These kids, oh, sorry, these kids tend to be isolated. Right, we're going to do a little exercise very quickly in your head. Think back to eighth grade. All right, I know it's a long time, but think back to eighth grade. Your 14th birthday is coming up. Think of the kids in your class. Make a list of who you would invite to your party, who you want from your class to come to your party. Make a list of who you do not want in that party. Now, the kids who are on your do invite list are the popular, easygoing, friendly kids, typically. Some popular, but more easygoing, the friendly kids, the kids you get along, they're, they're good kids. They're going to go, they're going to have fun, you know, they're going to have a good time. The kids who are on the do not invite list, ADHD, oppositional disorder, <laughs> you know, dysregulated affect, the girls who are like always like, oh, drama queens. These are the ones who are going to disrupt your party. You don't want them there. They're going to steal, steal the attention. They're going to ruin it, you know, the whole nine yards. But here's, 
a question. Think of all those kids in your eighth grade class. Which kid didn't make either list? Think. This is the kid at lunchtime who stays in the classroom, not because he's punished and has to clean the erasers, but because he doesn't get out with you on the playground. This is the kid who's been isolated and away from everybody. The popular kids or the kids to invited we call the peer accepted. The externalizing kids are peer rejected. Our socially phobic kids are peer neglected. You neglect to include them because you don't think about them because they haven't been present in front of you. So watch these kids because they avoid social, social situations. They become isolated. They get very uncomfortable when they're the focus of attention, right? And you know they're afraid of making mistakes. The child with GAD doesn't want to make a mistake because she won't get into the college of her dreams. The child with social phobia doesn't want to make a mistake because the teacher's going to know I'm stupid and then she's not going to think I can handle anything. And you know, she's worried about the negative evaluation. GAD has a self-imposed standard that's high. Social phobia is worried about everybody else thinking they're stupid and not able to handle. Now, the big thing with cognitive restructuring, we want to find out what these socially anxious kids are thinking. So now on their diary forms, we're asking them, you know, really to go into what is it that I think, that component, and try to uncover what are the predictions I'm making about situations. I love this one. If I go to the party, no one will talk to me. Okay? I'll feel foolish. People are going to think I'm, you know, I shouldn't be there. Why did she come? You know, okay? So this is, you know, first of all, the thought, no one will talk to me. They'll, they'll think, why the heck is she here? They are treating their automatic thoughts as complete fact. If I go, I'll be rejected. If I try, I'll be laughed at. Okay? Now, the thing of it is, because they haven't been going, they don't have more information to challenge their own thought. They don't have the experience of going to the party or to the, the club or to raising their hand and trying to answer a question. They don't have that experience because they've been trying to fight against that. So that's why we're going to move in a little bit to exposures. But we have to help them figure out a rational way of thinking that is not positive thinking. How many of you remember Stuart Smalley? He is now a senator from Massachusetts. No, from Minnesota. Al Franken used to be this character on Saturday Night Live who would sit in front of a mirror and say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Google, Google uh, who was it, um, the basketball player? Chicago Bulls. Michael Jordan shows up on one of these segments on Saturday Night Live. Michael Jordan shows up with Al Franken. Al Franken would do these positive thoughts. It was a whole parody on the positive thinking movement because I'm smart, I'm loved, and he would break down crying. And then Michael Jordan shows up and says, now, now, Stuart, let's talk about what really is going on. Come on, what did you do this week? And then it was like Michael Jordan being the rational responder. Realistic thinking is what kids need. Positive thinking doesn't give them anything to hang their hat on. They sit down to take a test. I'm smart. I'm smart. I'm going to ace this. <laughs> that doesn't help with taking a test. But if they sit down to take the test and they say to themselves, OK, wait. I did do some studying. I listened a bit in class. Let me figure out, I'll do the questions I know first, and then go back and do the ones that are more challenging. They're thinking realistically, focusing on what I know I've done to prepare, how much I've gotten through in preparing, and how I can deal with this situation. So it's not, we don't want them to be positive thinkers. We want them to be realistic, problem-solving, coping-focused thinkers. 
Okay? So that's very important. So the thing that we want to do, there's a couple of models. Wendy Silverman's model is thinking about stop. Are you scared? What thoughts are you having? What other helpful thoughts can you think of? Praise yourself for practicing them. The fear model comes from the Coping Cat program for anxious kids by Phil Kendall. His is the original. Are you feeling frightened? Are you expecting bad things to happen? What actions and attitudes can you take to help yourself? And then rate how you did and reinforce yourself for, for trying. And then for older adults, for adolescents, I use the straightforward identify your automatic thoughts and let's come up with a cognitive restructuring response. So the kid who says to me, I can't go to that party, uh, no one will talk to me, I say, okay. Oh, by the way, who sent you the invitation? <laughs> How'd you get that invitation? Well, uh, you know, uh, I've been in school with this girl, Samantha, since we were in kindergarten, and, you know, okay, so, you know, we're sophomores in high school, so she invited me just because. Oh, she invited the whole 2,000 kids in the sophomore class? I don't know, but, you know, okay, so, all right, so let's understand. Uh, you were invited by Samantha. Yeah. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, okay, Samantha invited me. One person wants me at the party. Okay, the rational response, the girl holding the party, at least one person want, has invited me to be there. That's a little different from nobody wants me to be here. Okay, second thing. When you go to the party, what do you think you could do that would, you know, put you in the mix of meeting the other kids? Oh, I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, you know, usually if something, if I ever go to these things, you know, I, I usually just go to the bathroom until it's time to go home. <laughs> no joke. No kidding. Okay? Here's the thing. Remember, these kids are trying not to be noticed. And sure enough, they go into these social, whether you drop them at the school dance, the football game, uh, somebody has a party, first day at your camp, whatever it might be, they are looking for the spot where they won't be noticed and it'll confirm their anxiety and their predictions. So now you have to say, so, okay, unless, you know, it's a community bathroom from the Roman era, what in the world, <laughs> where can you put yourself that makes it a little more likely that someone's going to pass by and say hello? The food table. The food table. I teach my socially anxious kids to find the food. <laughs> and not to go, suppose that's the food table. I don't want them going like this. <laughs> I want them to stand next to it, maybe having a cup of Hawaiian punch in their hands, not spiked, thank you, and, you know, just kind of stand there. Hey, how you doing? Because you're facing the crowd instead of being away from the crowd. You're in a place maybe people will walk by. Samantha certainly will say hello. And it's giving you an opportunity then to sit. And I'm going to want you to stay there a minimum of 10 minutes. And I'm going to want you to just sit and ride that wave of anxiety. OK? And this is where we might do some role playing of, you know, how to say hello, what to, you know, ask people, and, or how to talk and make conversations. But the big part is getting over the hump of getting them into these situations in the first place. And this is where you really got to ask, well, what did you do when you went there the last time? Why was it so hard? Where were you? What? Because you find out that they are making themselves small, and you've got to help them to open it up. This is where we do behavioral experiments little mini exposures in my office where you can think about this. I, I, I love this part of behavior therapy. I'm right on Broadway in uh, Manhattan, busy street, lots of city buses, lots of people always queued up to be on the bus. And we have these metro cards that you put in the, you know, in the meter. I have a stack of them that are completely empty, no tokens on them. And I hand the kid the stack, 
Uh, well, first I do this myself. Let's go downstairs. We want to expose kids with social anxiety to all kinds of situations where they're the focus of attention. We're going to go downstairs. I have some metric cards. One of these 20 has a token on it. What are the predictions that you have for me getting on this bus here and standing there with dead cards? <gasps> oh my god, Dr. Albano. You're going to get screamed at. People are going to yell at you. The bus driver's going to be mean. OK, let's make all these predictions. Let's go. Write them all down. So then what we do, we stand there, and the bus comes. I let people get on. But I also have people who are behind me, because I want to hold up the line, too. <laughs> and I start. Put in the card. Beep. Oh, put in another card. Beep. Put in another card. Beep. What do you think, to, and the kid is standing right there at the bottom of the stairs watching. What do you think is ha happens next? This is New York. This is New York. <laughs> I'm going to dispel everything you think of us New Yorkers. Somebody offers you cards. Somebody, a lot of times people will say, hey, I got it, the person behind me usually. Or the bus driver goes, <laughs> and then I say, no, thank you. And I turn around. <laughs> And at the bottom of the steps, there is the kid. <laughs> the point being to test your predictions. At one in 10 times, the bus driver's like, try it later, lady. <laughs> OK, I will. And I get off the bus. So the point now, the next thing is, now we're going to wait for the next bus to come, and the kid's going to do it. You got to think of things close to your office, things that send them to the lawyer's office down the street to ask for pencils. Who cares? Get them doing stuff. It's, a, it's getting close to dinner time, and you've got patience until 8 o'clock. Have this kid order the pizza that you want or the submarine sandwich to call up you know, the delivery service. Whatever you can do, get them doing it with you right there. This is where, if you can do groups for the social phobia, that's good to do. Because the kids can work as they're, you know, helping when we are right near. If you ever come to New York and visit, welcome. We're right near Columbus Circle. There's a Whole Foods. They hate us. <laughs> when they see me or one of my colleagues coming in with five or six teenagers, they know we are going to be spilling soup. <laughs> we are going to be asking people to sit at their table. The kids, who they have to ask people who they don't know, may I sit here with you? And they're going to drool. We have them do things to embarrass themselves to see it's OK. We play a lot of charades. Uh, we do all kinds of like those fun mixer game type things we do in these sessions to get them to act silly, to make fools of themselves, to laugh about it, learn how to laugh about it. In the rain, when it's raining, it's like, time to go outside. We send the kids to ask people walking down the street, excuse me, can I borrow your umbrella? <laughs> <laughs> all right? Here's another one. You know those like Brookstone? You know those like yeah, Brookstone? Yeah, yeah. And, and you sit on the chair. You sit on the chair, right? Yes. It's a kind of, I send I got this from my friend David Castroblanco, a, a psychologist, CBT guy. I have them go and sit on the chair. Yeah. And you don't get up till the store manager comes to tell you to go. <laughs> because they have to have experience with this kind of thing and learning it's cool. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. I mean, it's important for them. So the typical distortions, the things that kids are mixing up in their heads here. I'm not as smart as other kids. I don't know what to say. These are all the, the errors in thinking. And what we go after, you know, is we help them characterize. Are you an all or none thinker? Do you disqualify the positive? You get a B plus on a test, and you think, I should have gotten an A. You know. Um, one of the, uh, what I love to do in terms of an exposure that we add into this, kids disqualify compliments, right? They can, you know, you say to a, a teenage girl, oh, I'd like your new haircut. Oh, no. <laughs> it's awful, right? So another exposure is to have them sit knee to knee facing you if it's just you and the child or pair them up with different people if it's a group or if you, can, if you have colleagues who could help. You have to sit knee to knee. Hold eye contact, and you get either you or the other person saying, I love the bow in your hair. I don't like it. 
See, and, and here's the thing. It's called a response prevention rule. You are only allowed to say thank you. And you give them about 10, and you pace it slowly. You give them about 10 compliments in a row. What typically happens is they start crying. And by about the sixth compliment, they start laughing and smiling. And then their rule is when they get compliments, they're only to say thank you. To teach them that. They're uncomfortable with being your focus. They've got to learn it's OK. It's all right. That's a powerful, powerful experience, especially when we do it in groups. And we give the kids then, then going forward, whenever you see Melissa, you're to compliment her. So it becomes like a lot of fun. You know, they compliment her on all sorts of stuff. So these are the different cognitive errors. You have them in your hands out. They, here's another thing borrowed from Al, Albert Ellis. Teaching the kids, especially the teenagers, don't shoot all over yourself. I should have done this. I should have done that. Don't be a masturbator. I must do, you know. The teenagers love this. It becomes, though, in their head, it's helping them to, uh, you give them stuff like that. It helps them recognize then when it's happening to them. Because remember, these are automatic thoughts that have been sort of programmed in their mind. They just run with it. But now you're interrupting that thought, oh, I must, oh, wait, no, I must not. You know, you, in, you're interrupting it, giving them a signal to recognize the negative thinking. And to say, wait a minute, what am I telling myself? I got to change this, all right? And so then we have, we make cue cards with index cards of these dispute handles. Quest, learn to question your thoughts. I'll have kids program them into their iPads, iPhones, whatever these i things are that they have. Have them program them in so they refer to these. Um, and then what happens is they use these to challenge their thoughts. Um, does Mary's opinion reflect that of everyone else? Do I have a crystal ball? And so forth. Little kids, I don't, I, I'm out of touch with South Florida, but find whoever the figure is that they like. None. None. Anyway, we got Derek. As long as Derek lives, he's my guy for this. But, you know, you give a younger child, here's like a 9 to 13 year old, especially the boys, seventh inning, seventh, I mean, seventh, ninth inning, seventh game, two outs, score is tied, World Series, Derek's up. What is he thinking when he gets up to bat? And this is what you do I can't do this. I want to go home. I need my mommy. And the kid just falls out. No, Derek Jeter wouldn't do that. You know, OK. Derek takes a swing, and he misses. Does Derek then say, I knew I was a loser? OK, the kids follow you. They're like, of course not. So what is Derek thinking? Derek Jeter is saying to himself with each pitch, ah, he's throwing a certain kind of pitch. All right, I got this guy. I've been here. I know what to do. And the kids will say, he practices. He knows. He practices. Mm -hmm. All right? So the thing is that Derek is evaluating the situation and figuring out, all right, I know this picture now. I'm going to put this thing over the right field, right into the bleachers. The thing is to help them understand the coaching style is on their efforts, that the situation has to be evaluated realistically, that you do have experience, and with exposures, you're gaining more experience in how to handle this. How many times has Derek Jeter struck out playing ball? Have them Google that. They're shocked. Why doesn't he quit? He's struck out more than he's connected with the ball. Why is he still playing? He should have been fired, according to your metric. So have them see. <laughs> Wait a minute. He sticks with it. You focus on coping, how I'm going to handle this. And yeah, there's spring training for a reason. Those guys get fat in the wintertime. They got to get out and run around a little, get back into the game. So we need to practice. All our efforts are important, no matter how small. All right? And so then you're going to do exposures. And that's your treatment of the kids with social anxiety. And it's a lot of get copies of tests, all kinds of stuff. We do a lot of this kind of what those tutors do for $500 an hour, we're going to do in the exposures. 
for thirty-two fifty. <laughs> All right. Attention seeking. Here for this and also for the uh, tangible reinforcers, this is what we're looking at here. Focus now is more on the parents. Restructuring the way they give commands. I am sitting down here in the kitchen waiting, so would you get out of bed and put on your clothes and brush your teeth and get ready and put your backpack together and come down here, you have two minutes. <laughs> That's a parent command, didn't you know? Yeah. How should they reframe that? One at a time and go up and get right in front. I got to tell you, uh, Dr. Reitman and I in the back belong to the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. And when I was on the board, I looked in to getting a certain speaker to come to our um, annual conference. But her fee was too high for us, $40,000 for one hour talk. <laughs> Super nanny. <laughs> Super nanny, man. <laughs> Whoa. She's super duper. So, but the thing of it is, I do have snippets of Super Nanny to show parents. And I do recommend they watch her here and there. Uh, because, you know, it's getting down to the kids' level, making eye contact, and one at a time. You're getting out of bed now. Pull the covers back, you know, one at a time, and not saying, and, and, you know, and engaging them. You're making mommy upset, you know, every time you do this. No, forget that stuff. You're Joe. You, I want you to be Joe, channel Joe, you know, and do things in a step-by-step -step way in terms of the commands you're giving. We've got to get those fixed routines in place. Now, we will use forced attendance. I'll get to that in a little bit. There will be negative consequences for school refusal. Oh my gosh, we've got, you know, we've got to do that up and we want to set up positive consequences for attending. Number one principle to teach parents, grandma's rule, otherwise known as the pre-mac principle. Great example. <laughs> uh, you can't figure out who this is, so I'll, but I'll, so I had a Italian guy, celebrity guy, referred to me for his kids and him and his wife. That's it. I'm just going to say that. Aww. But so anyway, we are working his, with his was it child. And one day, as it turns out, I'm with my niece and nephew from Minnesota. I have them at Ellis Island. And you know, we're walking around Ellis Island and stuff, showing them where, where grandpa came from, from Sicily, how he came in. And my cell phone rings. It's a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And I answer the phone. And this is what I hear. Dr. Albano, I'm going to kill this kid. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> and it's this guy. I'm like, calm down a second, calm down. So I send Aaron and Matt over to play somewhere. OK, what's up? I'm going to kill him. I, I got, you, you got to help me. I got it. My wife's on the phone, too. I, she's trying to calm me down because I want to wring his neck. What happened? Last night, we were at Circuit City. And he looks at me. He says, Daddy, Daddy, please, get me the Xbox. I'll be good. <laughs> so I got that. I said, you really going to be good? This means when I tell you to do something. <laughs> oh, God. This is where I say, hey, stunatza. Do you know what that means? In my head, I didn't say this to him. So he buys, yes, he's a batza. So he buys the thing for the kid. This next morning, it's Saturday morning, they're supposed to be at some cousin's first holy communion. Big deal for Italians, you know? And this kid was, has not gotten dressed. He says, we're supposed to be there. He's not dressed. I, I, give, give me the, he's on the gosh darn day thing. I, yeah, yeah. I'm like, slow down a second. Listen, Goomba, let me ask you a question. I said, when you were a kid growing up, did you used to go to your grandmother's house on Sundays after church? Yeah, every week. OK, you go there for Sunday dinner about 1 o'clock in the afternoon? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. What did she do first? Give you a cannoli or give you the pasta? Hey, first you eat your spaghetti, then you get the cannoli. Oh, doctor, you're so brilliant. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm so brilliant. I said, take the box away. Pull the plug, put it back in the box it came from, and you explain to him. First, we, you get ready, you do, then you get 10 minutes. I love 10. I love 10 minutes of the Xbox for when you follow directions. 
and that's it. Otherwise, the thing goes in the closet. So, A, you know, you could use whatever. This translates across cultures. <laughs> All right? So, grandma's rule is so important for them to hear. We have to set up how to give commands. Sometimes parents don't get it. Say when the command is to be carried out and what is exactly required of the child but simple. And bear in mind, it is amazing how many complex things parents ask little kids to do. We want to keep it simple. Ensure that they understand the command and it's something they can do, right? And that nothing competes with the child's attention. So if you've got baby brother sitting over here with a chip witch gnawing on, you know, the ice cream, he's drooling all over the place, and you're saying, you've got to finish your homework before you have, no, it's not going to work. You've got to make sure there's nothing competing with the attention, right? And we tell parents that means locking up the electronics. It's really easy to just go to the back of the computer, and there is a, 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 a wire that hooks into the monitor that goes into the hard drive. Ooh, take it. You unplug that thing, and they can't see anything anymore, and you could take that to work with you. <laughs> All right? Yay. I had an Irish mother. My gosh. <laughs> Avoid questions, criticism, and lectures. This is a big one. And this is why I like that super nanny, because she shows them, especially like these kids in the middle of the night coming out of the parents' bed, and I love they have the counter, 47th time out of bed tonight. I love that. But she shows them the parent just picking the kid up, putting them down, and not speaking and engaging and trying to coerce them. And you've got to role play this. Stay neutral in tone. This is where I try to teach parents deep breathing. Give the parents some relaxation. Because they have to stay mindful, centered, whatever they call these things these days. They've got to stay in control and calm. Right? And the important thing here is to question the parents, what do you think is going to happen if this child is going to obviously get upset. They're, they're, they're going to push you because you've given in in the past. What's going to happen? The, a lot of times parents give in because the level of upset the child works themselves up to, the parent is afraid they're causing psychological damage in the child. So again, this is where, so let me understand this. This kid's crying, begging, pleading, sobbing today is going to be worse psychologically over time than them at the age of 30 sitting here at home with you without having gone to school, without having made friends, without having, let's, real, let's understand, which one will get you more anger from your kid? The 12-year-old's tantrum or the 30-year-old who was like, why the hell didn't you push me out of the door when you could have? And you really have to help them understand that because they're afraid they're causing harm. They're actually not. The harm is caused by allowing it to persist. That's the thing. And yes, mom and dad, look, I don't want to indict parents. I don't think parents are doing things wrong. They're doing what parents do. They're comforting. They're res rescuing. They're reassuring. They're protecting. That's what they do because the tears get you, right? I will admit, Aaron, Andrew, and Matt, my sister's three, I would take them each when they were little for a week or two down here to Florida from Minnesota to stay at my parents' house. Every night I was up walking the floors with them, you know, and they'd send them back to Minnesota. My sister's like, why aren't my kids sleeping through the night anymore? Oh, I couldn't, hey, I can't stand them crying. And it's just like, oh my God, you're the behavior therapist. I get it, I know it. <laughs> I'm the aunt. I could do this. You know, she'd fix it. So anyway, I get it. <laughs> but the thing, you know, the thing there is that's what's being pulled on. I understand that. That's what's being pulled on is, you know, but they, you have to help them find their island of Mykonos in their mind to separate themselves from that distress in the moment and see the bigger picture and stay calm and not get angry. And don't blame, and don't, don't rescue, all right? So, I, you know, validate that for them. Uh, 
Do not reward a child by having someone else carry out the command for her. So if you find that she's been paying her little sister to you know, do things, no. Uh, do the task with the child after the command, um, or do a task with them. So you got to immediately thank you. That uh, Mommy really appreciates that. You know, of course, putting a positive spin on it. Whoops. And reward compliance. And the punishing is time out or, you know, not earning the sticker or whatever it might be. You know, not getting to go out with friends if you haven't been in school, which is something. Three o'clock comes, school's over. Oh, now I can go hang out with my friends or meet my friends up. They're getting out of school. Mom, I'm going down to the corner. Everybody's getting together for pizza. Hello? No, no, no. You know, so we've really got to work with these parent commands and sticking to a system in the house. Yes? Kids who like, parents says, okay, you can't go out with your friends, but they go anyway. Those are the, I guess, oh. the opposition. These are oppositional kids. You can't go out your, with your friends. You go out anyway. I got I to tell you about this other kid. We're going to go to 345. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. So here's a kid with school refuser, uh, like spotty school refusal stuff, manipulative of the parents, like no tomorrow. So she'd delay every morning getting to school. And it was usually, every morning there was a test or she knew there was something challenging to her. And this is New York City. So what does she do? What happens one day? She delays so much and both parents uh, worked. And so they call a car service to take her to school because they had to leave. And they put her in the car service at the front door. You know, they put her in the car and said, take her. And they go off. But they didn't tell the driver where school was. They're on the Upper West Side. And the school is like on the east side. She told the driver, it's on Staten Island. <laughs> it took the guy, it takes about you know, an hour. He gets to Staten Island. And he's like, where? She says, I was kidding. She got out of school. It was her way of delaying school. There was no consequence. She was out with friends then, that night. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. She'd be washing dishes and all kinds of stuff in my house. Oh my goodness. Uh, the thing you got to watch for is we don't want to just be, and parents will say, why do I have to bribe my kid and give them rewards for doing something they're supposed to do? Well, that's true. You know, a kid can win a prize in a pie eating contest, but it won't make them eat more pies. We want reinforcement to be about the efforts and things that are related, you know, to their well-being and moving them forward, not to be buying prizes. So I really work a lot with families on the social reinforcement and att positive attention from the parents and making naturally occurring things in, in the environment now contingent upon them getting them. I don't think being born is a reason why you deserve a, an iPod <laughs> or you know tickets to a Jets game or whatever. But some people think that way. It's like, no, 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 no. You know, we got to move it back that the things that they value include, and mainly attention and stuff, is contingent upon the way they perform in terms of doing the things that they are responsible for doing. So this is why we don't go after just giving rewards. We go after focused, make sense, linked, you know, reinforcers. Combine parent-focused interventions with child-focused exposures. So while the, child, the parents are learning about commands, we're setting up schedules and all that stuff is going on. You're also working with this child with separation anxiety to separate from mom and dad. And you're doing that in a gradual exposure kind of way. All right? Potential problems when we have single parent family and there's no help in the house to help reinforce mom. So we have to problem solve around that. Is there a relative or a friend who could help out in different ways? And mainly here, that means taking care of the other kids or doing things so that mom could focus on working with this child and the problem. When you've got multiple school refusers, I say you do group school refusal stuff. Everybody's put on the routine. Everybody, you know, this is where, OK, this is a house that no longer has a television, has no iPods, has no computers. And they're earning it back collectively, a little peer pressure. Oh, I'm sure the dynamic people are like the sibling rivalry <coughs> she's causing is going to like. But that's how you do it. You got to put it all together that as a family, we will have things in this house again when everybody's on the same page. 
Okay. Um, another problem, parents differ in their responses to the child. This is like this child I, I talked about earlier today. Mom was focused on his migraine headaches and we're going to do something terribly damaging to him. Whereas dad wanted to be like General Schwarzkopf that comes in and just like gets this kid marching again. <coughs> I had to bring them together. Helping the, let the dad be the guy who soften his touch a little, but let him be the guy to do the morning routine to get the child out the door because mom over momified him. But then mom could be the one to work with homework in the afternoon, which she was much better at. Let's find what works for you all. And also address to dad, I know you grew up with the school of hard knocks and oh yeah, you're a perfect guy right now. Get it? But that's not what's going to work for your child. You've tried it and it isn't working. And in fact, you know, we know that stuff really doesn't change a child, especially <coughs> with anxiety. Um, wait until the problem is severe. This is, as, this is why school personnel don't get to the point where the home unit is coming in. It's got to happen early. We need teachers, school counselors who are low in the school, principals, whomever, to take notice of who's coming late and, and get in there earlier and try to get the parents in earlier. We have to watch parents reverting to old patterns of behavior. It is easy to let it slip back. Very easy to let it slip. I have to say, when, we, when parents are on board and we put a school routine in place and we arrange all these contingencies that you get this if you do that, if things work that way, this six weeks turns around kids who have had school refusal for less than a year. It turns them around in a good six weeks. But we need the parents to be on board. And then the thing is they have to stick with it because there's going to be what we call spontaneous remission, little bursts here and there where I don't want to go. <laughs> And if you've had a bad night, a hard week at work, you know, fine, stay home. You can't do that with these kids. No, I know you're feeling miserable. You know what? You're going tonight. Let's just take it easy. You get to bed a little earlier, but you're going. No more mental health days or any of that kind of stuff. We're not going to do that. Um, parent disagreements, escalating the child's behavior, and a parent leaving the situation. We've got to work on everybody and managing their emotions keeping cool heads. This is where you might have some family therapy stuff in there, you know, family problem solving, family communication training. Parent becomes nonchalant when their child returns to school. Oh, that is the kicker. And it's the kicker with any behavioral program. You've known this with working with children. If they give in and start getting lazy to following the plan, oh boy. So we all have to stay on the same page. And if things start Going back again, you've got to say, okay, we're not back to square one. It worked up to this point. Now let's get back to what made it work. All right, so it's not that we're back to, st back to step one. I just wanted to put these establishing fixed routines. You've seen these slides. The morning routine, because you need them for these kids, especially for these kids who have been out for a while, have the separation anxiety, or having, you know, the tangible reinforcers. You've got to get them through having a regular routine that's focused around school issues. And that's a, okay. Nights and weekends, no normal fun activities. Sorry. Not until you're functioning and going to school. Set a routine at night and you link it to school attendance You've got to link it to if you've attended, if you've gone, then we have, you know, a family game night or ice cream or whatever, but it's got to be linked. You've got to set up consequences for the weekend, sorry, which means you're not going out with friends if you haven't put in a full week. And try to initiate part-time attendance it's, if that's what you could get at first, we would go after. Who do we force in? Well, let me say this. If the child is under 11 and understands that we're going to be picking him up and carrying him in. Typically when we have two parents or a parent and another adult, because someone's got to sit with the child while the other drives the car and sit with the child in the back seat, right? Um, 
and when you have parents and school officials willing to engage in this process. So the parent drives up to the front door of the school, and you've got the principal and the, the gym teacher standing there, and they're ready to receive the child. And to receive them in a, in a you know, supportive but firm way. Come on, let's go, you know, take them out of their mom's hands, help disengage her. You know, we're going to go in now. Here's the thing, they usually stop their antics once they get in the door. Because they don't want the other kids to see, you know. And that's typically, you know, and the parents might hand over a bag of clothes if he's still in his pajamas. But that's all right. And this is typically for the kids who are the separation anxious. It's motivated by attention, all right? And we usually do this when they're missing more school days than not, not for someone who's just into this. It works. Potential problems, again, uh, you've got to look for physical complaints. Uh, if the parents can't bring themselves to do this, we've got to get that parent some therapy about this. If the school isn't willing to help, oh, I hope that isn't the case. Um, you know, and if they start some disruptive behavior, we have to work with the school to try to sit through that and how to manage that. Because remember, kids are going to try things because they don't want to be there. Yeah, the oh, oh, well, let's, let, let's put them through metal detectors. <laughs> For the kids who get tangible reinforcement, Set up times and places to negotiate problem solutions. Here we're focusing the parents and kids. Now, we're going really, to take reinforcers away, and we're going to make contracts for earning privileges. And the contracts will be, if you do school-related stuff, you get your privileges that you're looking for. Um, here at times, we have to do some communication skills training and, and peer refusal skills with the parents. It's all that we've just talked about, but you know, much more of a focus because they're not showing you much anxiety. This is more of kids who have learned to be oppositional and learned to just, you know, sit at home. We've got to get them now rearranged in terms of the structure of the house and the routine and the reinforcers that they're contingent on the behavior. We have family meetings. Call the meeting to order. We discuss a contract we're going to work out. We use simple statements, allow people to speak uninterrupted. We use all the little things you use in family problem solving. Whoever has the pencil is the one speaking. No one else speaks. Then it moves to the next person. All the things you learn in family therapy and approaches like that, but it's focused in a behavioral frame. Because we're foc focusing on there's a problem behavior, and we've got to find the solutions that we're all going to work on, and we're going to do it in a way, if you do X, then you get Y. And the family's going to get, you know, all involved in this. Meeting isn't dominated by anyone. Uh, we ask disrupt disruptive people to leave, right? Different things. It's a very family-focused intervention. The contracting process, I worked <laughs> with a guy who's an attorney in a big firm in Manhattan with his daughter. I said, we're going to draw up next time you're in. I said, next week when you come in, we're going to draw up a contract between you all on what is expected of her and you know, what you're going to reinforce that with in terms of privileges and such. He arrived the next week, no kidding, with a 10-paged, <laughs> typed out contract legally between binding. legally binding and legalese. I was like, oh my gosh. You know, it's like, OK, Dad. Great guy. I really like him. Three steps to find the problem, to find what school preparation involves, and what school attendance means. Doesn't mean walking up to the door and turning around and leaving. What does it mean? And at different steps, of course, as you've seen earlier, it may mean 30 minutes. It may mean the morning session. It may mean meeting with the teacher. You've got to put that, specify it in the contract, right? <laughs> Establish the problem definitions, how, you know, when you refuse school and you delay and you hide the car keys and whatever the kid's doing, negotiate contracts. Initially, we talk to the kids, what are you willing to do? What are the things you want? We talk to the parents separately and then bring them together. And we want the families to generate problems, to engage in problem solving. 
So using a whiteboard, let's brainstorm how to solve this problem. And the kid could say, you just let me stay home. That goes up there. You know, brainstorm and show them the process of addressing problem behaviors through brainstorming, evaluate each option, and then let's choose the one that we can all do, right? And so this is where a parent says, she's going to start back to school Monday and stay for the whole day. Ugh, that's, she can't do that yet. But let's go for Monday. She's going to go in at 10 o'clock in the morning. When you've had kids who have been out for a period of time, don't expect them to get that 8.30 class. Start with a little later, 10 o'clock in the morning, and she's going to stay for the, these two periods. So we've got to, you know, make sure everybody's on the same page. <coughs> Pitfalls, watch for the dynamics of the family, low motivation. And the, the problems in contracting, and you could, you know, read some of these. You know, the kids say yes when they're not even considering that they're going to attempt this. They feel pressured um, when families <laughs> abandon the contract. Uh, and they don't follow what's been written down, and they, they leave your office, and before they get home, they've agreed to something else completely. You know, there's all different kinds of, of ways that people are manipulating or changing and renegotiating. Negotiation and the contracts is here. That's it. There's no more discussion. This is what you're following for this week. Um, parents will escort the kids to school at times, uh, and this is... Again, a developmental thing. I have a child right now, a school refuser, who is allowing the parents to walk her together with, with them to within three blocks of the school. Then, because they want to make sure she goes, they cross the street. She continues to walk on her own on one side. They're walking on the other to see that she goes in the school. All right, you've got to watch. She doesn't want them right there with her because she's embarrassed. She's a seventh grader. You've got to allow them ways of getting in that saves face. You know, but if they need a little help with the parents going, that's okay. And we want the parents to be out of it as soon as possible. Um, and, you know, sometimes you need, again, the school counselor or favorite teacher or someone greeting them at the door. But do this in a way that's comfortable for the kids as much as possible, right? You might go to communication skills training for parents and kids who wind up being hostile, blaming, uh, you know, yeah, we could sign this contract, but I don't expect it's going to go anywhere. You know, come on. What we have to do here is practice conversations without hostility. So make a hierarchy of what are those situations that cause these parents and kids to struggle, and now we're going to practice talking about it and stop and point out to the father or the mother what sets your hot button. And look at how you just presented that to your child. Would I be motivated to go to school if you were saying, I don't really expect she's going to follow through? Come on. A lot of times what I'll do is role play some of this with the parents and tape record it. And I play back for them, let them hear what they've just said. You tell me what this sounds like. And this is where you tend to get, you know, one parent saying, well, he, you, you're being harsh on her. I've tried to tell you. And you can see how, you know, working with them to try to align with one another to encourage the child. All right? We do a lot of hypothetical scenarios. But the important thing is to try and get rid of that hostile, passive aggressiveness and stuff like that that is sabotaging to the plan of getting the kid into school comfortably. Some kids need to learn how to refuse offers to miss school <coughs> that, and this is not, again, the conduct disorder. There are chat rooms for school refusers, very much like the chat rooms for the bulimic kids. So you got to watch this because there's different things that kids are finding online that reinforces their I could stay out of school and do this online class, and there's online college, and there's online work, and I could, you know, and you've got to work with that. Um, and so we want to find out what they're being induced with, 
you've got to work role playing scenarios. Now sometimes, you know, they do, you know, they might talk to people on the phone or meet. You just got to work with them to again adjust their values and clarification of what they really want with themselves. Own the anxiety that got them here in the first place. This to me says, why am I letting someone else tell me not to go to school and convince me? What was it that kept me out in the first place? And that's where you're getting back to function one or two, typically. All right? And then, you know, we, the other thing in addition to these peer chat rooms to watch for is something called school withdrawal. This is where, this isn't like withdrawing from school officially. This is where a parent keeps a child home to meet the parent's needs. <laughs> parents with agoraphobia, parents who have medical issues, parents with access to personality issues, substance abuse, different things. They're watching the baby for the parent who, you know. And you got to watch that because it falls along in here too where you've got to shore up the child's assertiveness to say, no ma, sorry. I got to go to school. And you know, you're again doing family therapy work there and then a lot of focused stuff with the teen or the child. And this is my shameless self-promotion of our manual that puts all of this together and has all the forms I talked about in it. That should get you through school refusal. <laughs> questions. Now we got time for questions. Comments. Do you have an email? Do I have an email? Oh, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it on video. Ha -ha. My, in, my email is silverw at fiu.edu. I'm only kidding. That's Wendy Silverman. <laughs> <laughs> should kill me. <laughs> anyway. Well, we'll do it after this. Comments, questions. I'm telling you, I am calling, I'm calling the governor, and I'm telling him, you've got to put money back into schools. But it is a shame. I mean, it is the thing we find is when the economy and when economies are in crisis, money for, for mental health goes down the tubes in education. For some reason, we're expendable. Why is that? Oh, boy. Maybe we should all go down to the closest local pub, sit around, and start some kind of a political action committee of our own. The school refusal treatment committee or something. Because those are the kids who really suffer when resources go, or these kids who are, you know, have the mental health issues in school and educational issues. 